Good morning, Irene. Good morning. Hey, friends, you're watching Brainstorm Acres. I'm Henry. And I'm Irene. You want to talk about weather? Yes, it's important. So when you live in suburbia. Like where? Oh, like most suburbia, most everywhere, but particularly in very temperate parts of the United States, like say Southern California or something like that. Or Santa Clara Valley, which is Silicon Valley. The weather's pretty stable most of the time. Now I wouldn't say Atlanta's stable. You have certain things you can count on. Chances are the road surface will not go away. You might lose power. In severe cases, you might lose water. Mm-hmm. But you have this sense of security in your environment. We had a friend who moved from Southern California to Houston. Now, we used to live in the Houston area many, many years ago when the kids were little. <laughs> I worked in Southern Houston. We lived further south than that. It was mm -hmm. a nice little subdivision, nice yep. little development. Yep. And it was interesting because whenever we had a lot of rain, it was hard for me to get home right. from work. In fact, there was even one day we weren't having a hurricane, but we had some bad weather coming in. Right. I ended up driving down the median. SUW. <laughs> Sedan underwater, yes. <laughs> we had a friend move from Southern California to Houston. She'd been there probably a month. She was loving the apartment she'd found. She was loving her job. She was very excited. Now, and she was she was in San Diego area, if I recall. Was it San Diego? I think or? she was L.A., but somewhere down there. She's lived a couple of other places in California, but also fairly temperate climates. And I said, hey, heads up. And she's like, what? And I'm like, you've got a hurricane coming? So? So? <laughs> and I'm like, Houston floods, the store is closed, you lose power. Now, she really wasn't in bad shape. She's got the camping stove and all that kind of equipment. She could handle it. But she discovered the stores because she doesn't keep anything in, on, in stock in her house. The stores were closed. Well, Even she, Walmart was closed, which she could walk to from where she, her yes, apartment is. I was going to say, she could walk to pretty much anything that she needed. Right. The only problem is just like here when the power in town goes out and you go in to buy some fuel at the service station. You don't get fuel. Sorry, Charlie, you don't get fuel. We've had several people question lately how we figure out what our weather's going to be. <clears throat> and it's is a that challenge. A cauldron and eye of newt, toe a frog. Right, right. And and a crystal ball rotating above the top of it, kind of suspended in air. Yeah, that's that's what you need around here. It's well, I think it's any place, not just here. It, it used to be very, very predictable in many parts of the U.S. But we've noticed over the past four or five years, a lot of the areas that we've lived in before aren't as predictable as they once were. Right. Well, one of the, uh, one of the channels that we have recommended heavily on YouTube is Direct Weather. His goal is weather stuff. And he explains to you all the different computer models and this and that and the other thing and what the different models are saying. Because he'll go through all the different possibilities as the various things show. And he'll go through like a, about a week at a time, sometimes 10 days at a time. And he'll talk about how once you get out to 10 days, it becomes really flaky and stuff like that. But he's really straight up front with it. He's not like the local weather guy who's always trying to make it sound wonderful. When we lived in Massachusetts, for instance, we were living in a small town named Sharon. And we figured out that if we wanted to figure out what the weather was going to be, we looked at the weather from uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and the weather from Worcester, and the weather from Boston. Boston. And then we could extrapolate. Uh, and the way we figured that out was we looked at our actual thermometers and saw what our weather was, and then we began to learn what the weather patterns were. Now, that was back in the late 90s. Find out where your local weather station is. Our local weather station, run by the National Weather Service, is eight miles north of town in the National Forest. Which is great, but the only problem is- We don't live in the National Forest. <laughs> not only we not live in the National Forest, we have friends who live here on Juniper Wood Ranch, which is about 100,000 acres that have been subdivided in one piece, only three miles away by air, so straight line. You can have a huge difference. Huge. We had very good friends who lived literally three miles away uh -huh. by air. Right, and I knew her husband was out of town, and I called her to make sure she was okay because we had just had four inches of rain in an hour. What rain? Yeah, well, it was during monsoon. 
and it was just torrential. And she's like, is it raining? It sprinkled here a little. That's three miles away from us as the crow flies. Uh, the gentleman who delivered our gravel the last time, he lives in a back valley. He finds that the weather forecast is off by 15 degrees in the wintertime. He will be 15 degrees colder because of the orientation and the depth of that valley. So you have to figure out what works for you. You know, you talk about weather. And most people think about weather as, is it going to rain or is it going to shine? Is it going to snow or are we going to have fog? Are we going to have hail or are we going to have big winds? And that's a nice, easy way of looking at whether those are the physical things that happen to you. But there's a lot more that goes into weather. You can do a big study. It's a lot of science. It's been more or less science for a long while, but that science is not as predictable now as it was. No, well, the web, direct weather guy was saying that the algorithms, the, the mathematical computer science programs that they developed to say if this happens, then that happens, then that happens, based on weather data, are no longer accurate. Yeah, well, to give you an example, if you've ever watched uh, an atmospheric oscillator at work, they produce some really nice cloud patterns, and the patterns repeat at regular intervals. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we have a nice atmospheric oscillator that's a, some distance away from us on the west and it puts out these really nice japanese looking waves yeah it looks just clouds. like just like a, a japanese painting from the 1800s or something where you have the waves that look like this <laughs> and and it'll be that in the sky yeah it, it may seem odd but all of that sort of behavior is predictable according to a field of science called fluid dynamics and yeah atmosphere air moisture, clouds, that's all fluids. You don't think about it that way, but that's what it is. It behaves like fluids. So, if you could only predict everything is going on all over the place, well, you really can't. No matter how good your model is, the models don't work on a really small area. Now, for us and a lot of other people, we live in the inter-mountain inter region of the western United States. Right, that means we're between the Sierras on the west and the Rockies on the east. And we're in that wedge there. And which, we, it, which is a very interesting place to live. There's a lot going on. When we watch our weather, we don't just watch, okay, the general flow in the United States is west to east. Okay, that's nice. Sometimes when San Diego and LA get a big rain, it comes across directly. Sometimes it slides up into Salt Lake City or something like that, and they get snow and we get nothing. Sometimes everything's cool there, nothing's happening, all of a sudden the storm comes into Baja. So I'm always watching the hurricanes that come into Baja. Before a storm's coming in, we have all the water we need, we have all the fuel for the generator we need. We know that the generators, at least one if not two, preferably two, are both running well in case something decides to in the middle of the whole storm. Shh, don't tell anybody I have three that run. Hey, you know, I would be happy with a farm, like a whole entire <laughs> building full of them. We focus on what happens because we live off-grid rural America. We're about five and a half miles from a, a secondary state highway, mm -hmm. and we're about 6.2 miles direct line of sight to the nearest power pole. So we look at a lot more detail than what people who live in suburbia might look at. But you know, you still have to look at what's going on around you and around your area and the areas that are going to be sources of weather coming your way. Mm -hmm. Whether it's gonna be a big storm, a lot of wind, tornadoes, mm -hmm. hurricanes, you need to watch to see what's going on because you can make a huge difference in your quality of life after a big event happens. Right, well, it was funny because people will say, well, talk to your neighbors. Well, I don't know, maybe everybody here has a lack of memory and everybody every place else has a really good memory, but I don't think that's the way it works. Yes. I'll be sitting here talking to a local who's been here for 30 years and they'll say, oh, that never happens. And I'm like, what about 12 years ago when everybody in Northern Arizona lost their pipes because it froze down to like three feet? And they're like, oh yeah, that's right. People tend to put aside 
bad things like that? I mean, when you, when you rattle their head and you make them remember that this happened, then they could start telling you stories about, oh, I remember standing in the, in the post office chatting with anybody about who had PVC fittings that we could trade with one another and stuff like that. The more aware you are, the less surprised you'll be, the more comfortable you'll be. You know, we have to actually be careful when there are power outages in the area because we don't know there's a power outage unless we hear it somewhere. Or unless you tell Henry, the power's off. You want to go figure out what's going on? If the town, last year, the town had no power for a week, that means there's no gas at the gas stations because none of the gas stations here have generators. And, none of them. And there were no groceries to be had. And, and the way we found out about this is we went into town and all of the frozen food coolers were... Taped across. I used to listen to rural radio a lot. Now, rural radio, I think, is it in Wisconsin or Minnesota or something like that. But the reason they were so good, they had, you know, you think farm big ag bad well they also had they i did listen to the big ag bad some stuff because it was interesting i mean it's informative kind of like know the enemy sort of thing but there was also a lot of stuff in there they had organic programs they were talking about and i remember one of the old the guy said his his entire farm is organic his father died from cancer and he was pretty confident that it was from exposure to all the chemicals they'd used when he was a kid and he liked the fact that he knew his kids were not anywhere near any of that kind of stuff. Not that organic chemicals can't be dangerous too, but they're a lot safer in general and they don't have the residual effects that most uh, non-organics do. But they were spectacular for weather forecasting, providing really good timing for the farmers so that they would know, okay, I'm going to, like we foliar feed sometimes. I'm going, to, foliar feeding is when you're spraying your fertilizer onto the actual leaves of the plant and the plant is actually going to take those nutrients into the leaves directly. If I spray right before rain, I have just totally wasted my fertilizer. It's going to wash off. Now it'll get into the soil and stuff, but if you're doing foliar feeding, you're usually trying to get something into the plant quickly and it'll eventually get there, unless of course it rains a lot, in which case it might just roll off into a ditch somewhere, but you got to know that sort of stuff. So we discovered that rural radio was a huge, wonderful source. I mean, so much more accurate than anything we were seeing anywhere else. We don't do much natural, normal news programs and stuff. So there's nobody coming on saying, oh, on your six o'clock news tonight, hi, I'm the cute little weather guy. And we don't have a weather person coming on and saying, here's your forecast. If we see a forecast, if we're lucky to see a forecast by some magic, or even hear one on the radio, chances are it'll be for Williams and Flagstaff. That's the best we get. For many years, in fact, most of our married life, Irene's kept a more or less daily log, and certainly for the past 10, 12 years. Well, I have, the, I have actually, I kept, actually kept a diary for probably seven years where I literally wrote down the temperature and humidity and all, the, and all that kind of stuff and how much rain we got every single day for seven years. And then after that, I kind of got away from that, but we have a weather station which records. And I download that a couple times a month to a computer. So it's all in the computer. So we were talking yesterday, the fact that it's been cold lately. It's been in the teens for days at night. It wasn't supposed to be, but it is. And I'm like, it's in my imagination, it's colder than it's supposed to be at this time of year. Usually we don't get this kind of consistent cold until January, February. So that brings up a real interesting point about weather forecasts and long range weather forecasts. We were told the beginning of this season, the it's fall and winter, warmer. that it's going to be warmer. Well, what that means isn't that every day is going to be warmer. Mm -hmm. It means that on average, over the four to six month period they're talking about, it's going to be warmer than the corresponding four to six month period of the previous year. Right. Well, that's been the case here. We're on average warmer, but we've been mm, but hotter and colder. There's storms that came in that they didn't expect. I mean, they've just been totally blindsided. It's one of the few professions that you can be wrong every single day. And not get fired. <laughs> Check your weather apps. If you have a smartphone, 
Check your weather apps. <laughs> now, we laugh about that because we, have, we both have iPhones. We'll be sitting on different ends of the sofa, and we will have different forecasts. You have to look at the weather apps that are out there. You have to look at your forecasts, and you have to see what works for you. And you may have to do something like what we used to do in Massachusetts. The first place we lived, we extrapolated using Providence, Worcester, and Boston. The second place we lived there, we only paid attention to Boston and Worcester because the 90% the of the time, unless it was a hurricane or a nor'easter coming in on the coast, the weather came from west to east. So we knew that Worcester was going to be colder than us and Boston was going to be warmer than us. And if Worcester had two feet of snow, we would get a foot. You know, that sort of stuff. And you have to be the one who's paying attention. The logs that Irene keeps, both in computer form, which either one of us can do, and the notebooks that she's kept for many years, that allows us to calibrate the weather forecast that we're having from all these different sources mm -hmm. with, what, with what's actually happened and happening. It's work. Mm -hmm. There's no easy way of getting around it. If you want to really understand what's going to be happening to your property, your homestead, your apartment, you have to put the effort in to understand what the reliability of each of these different weather sources can be. For us, the best source that we have is Irene. <laughs> you can figure this out. Do you, know, do you know what time it is, Irene? It is time to encourage people to take responsibility for themselves. That's what it comes down to. Responsible, responsible for themselves? Yes. Well, it's not just about gardening, it's about everything. <laughs> everything. There's, there's no getting away from it. It's easy to become complacent when you live in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. It's even easier to become complacent when you live in the cities and high rises. Yeah. But at the end of the day, when everything is said and done, you have to take personal responsibility for your own life and the life, lives of your loved ones. Right. Because you're the ones who are going to be there on the scene when it first happens. Right. You're the ones who can make the difference. So be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell, and pay attention. That's all it takes most of the time is paying attention. Freeze-dried water. Always remember the freeze-dried water. <laughs> so until yeah. next time, bye. Bye. <laughs> well, we always joke about Fiji water. They sell it, send it over from Fiji freeze dried, and then they <laughs> rehydrate it here. Yeah. <laughs> keep, keep brainstorming, as you can tell, we are right. <laughs>